Hey guys, so I got a bit of a different setup today with my phone. I thought I'd record on my phone instead of my webcam. And uh, I thought I'd review the Jess Franco movie, Venus and Furs. And so I'll read the description and I'll talk about some of the stuff that I noticed, some things I liked. Uh, it says, of all the twisted hits from cult director Jess Franco, Sadomania 99 Women, this is the one that fans and critics alike call his masterpiece. Masterpiece. Uh, James Darren, the guys of Navarone, uh, Deep Space Nine, stars as a traumatized trumpeter suckered, sucked in a whirlpool of psychosexual horror among, among or along with his sultry girlfriend, singer Barbara McNair, a kinky lesbian, Margaret Lee of the Bloody Judds, and a brave playboy, the legendary Klaus Kinski and the mysterious and sexual beauty, luscious Maria Rom of Justine, who may lead them straight to hell. The Enterprise Vamp, Paris Lesbos, co-stars in this infamous shocker. It also features in an outstanding musical, uh, outstanding jazz score by British rockers Matt for Man. Venus and Furs has been remastered from original vault elements and is now presented in totally uncut, uncensored, and loaded with exclusive extras, including all new interviews with this Franco on the elusive Maria Rom. So, Venus and Furs. <laughs> well, this movie is, is trippy. Trippy as hell. I, I sort of agree with that. Um... I think for a time, for its time, worse so than it is nowadays. But still, um, so you start off. You have James Darren walking on the beach. He gets his trumpet out of, of the case, and he notices a woman uh, in, in the ocean. And she, you know, so he walks out, uh, brings her to shore, and she's cut up. She's not wearing a top. She's wearing stockings. I, I, if I remember, remember correctly, and so he's like, "Oh, she's dead, but she's beautiful." He's admiring her. He's wondering what happened, how she ended up there. So, what's interesting about that scene is, is that Franco plays with time because it, it slows down when he's going when uh, Dennis Price, no, not Dennis Price, James Darren, aka Jimmy, he does the cover he plays. He goes in the ocean. And so it slows down, and, and that happens one other time in the movie. So that kind of, to me, is part of what makes the movie kind of trippy, kind of out there. And I like that, because it's, you know, it didn't feel overused, that kind of effect in the movie. Because it's only used two or three times. And, you know, it, it like I said, it, it the pacing is pretty even throughout. Even though you have a bit of slowdown during those slow moments, it, it doesn't detract from the pacing. So, I mean, it, it worked in, in Franco's favor, and I didn't mind it. Um, so then, after that happens, it kind of goes back to where we see the woman before she was killed. There's a, there's a party scene, again, where Franco plays with time. But this time, the people in the party, you have Claude Kinsey, you have Dennis Price, you have Margaret Lee, those actors... It looks like they're just standing still. They're not moving around a lot. So that is interesting, too, because it shows me that, uh, you know, Jimmy is an ob observer. And to him, the world it, it slows down. and Because you only really see that when he's around. And I think that's, I think the reason why Franco does that was because he wanted, it kind of, there was like a build to the suspense, but it slowed down. As it built up, if that makes sense. And I thought that was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And so, like I said, Jimmy is an observer. He's your, your guide, your liaison to the world of Venus and Furs. And, he, you know, he does the job quite well in that aspect. Um, yeah, and I was saying the party scene so it slows down. So then you see the woman, and, and she is, uh, you know, whipped by I think Margaret Lee whips her and she you know for sure she's ripped off and then she's cut up by Klaus Kinski and that is why she dies is because of what they did to her and so that gets to the part where 
the characters, they think they got away with that, but they didn't, because slowly but surely the, the killings start happening. And the death scenes, they were kind of strange to me, because... I mean, for example, with Dennis Price, he played Percival Cap, I believe. His death scene is, like, she, she's not even, um... Maria Rom, her character, doesn't even make contact with him when he's killing her. Because, he, like, she goes into the room he's in, and he's, like, kissing her foot or something, taking off her stocking. Um, you know, trying to seduce him, basically. Because that's kind of how she... <laughs> Gets people dies in a way seducing him, or by seducing them, and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, it's not really necrophilia, I guess, because he's dead, but she's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know that happens, but the way the death scene is played out for Dennis Price for Cap. Is that like she said? She makes no contact with him. It's he just like looks. He just she just looks at him and he dies. But you can tell that like the way Cap is moving, it looks like she's making contact with him, even though she's not physically there. And I thought that was kind of interesting because there's really no uh, answer as to how Maria Rom. I forget the name of the character she played. Darn it. I want to look it up, but I don't want to waste time looking it up. And I had it, like, on the tip of my tongue yesterday when I, you know, the movie. Um, that's the problem I had with this movie is that, you know, while I'm on this subject, is that it didn't refer to the characters' names a lot throughout the movie, like once or twice, maybe. Maybe three or four. So you have to pay attention to know who's who in the movie. And I thought that that was kind of, you know, but anyway... I don't mean to take up time looking this up. Wanda Reed. That's who she played. Wanda. So, you know, Wanda and she... And the impression I got was, as I was saying, they don't really explain how she came back. So it, she... Like, before they know that it's her, like, She's the one killing them. She looks like somebody else. So my interpretation of that is that either she had possessed somebody, like her spirit, because they don't explain it, so it could be like a ghost thing, or just be her ghost, and she was able to look like somebody else. You know? And I thought that could have been explained better. Because <laughs> it was kind of uh, misleading. But, you know, it still works for the movie, and, and it still contributes to the horror aspect, because you don't really know, like, she came back, but you don't know, um, for me, I couldn't figure out how she was able to kill people if she's dead, because they don't explain it. But it is out of the horror aspect, because it's not really a horror movie, it's more of a thriller with horror elements, that's what I thought of it, anyway. But, you know, those aspect, aspects work, you know, fine. They were fine for what Frank was trying to do. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, well, the music, I like the music, Man for Man, the, the jazz. And I, the guy, I was just looking at one of the songs. Um, I think the intro by uh, Sid Dale was, was pretty good, too. It does fit with, you know, James Darren being a trumpet player. And you have that kind of music, you know, saxophone in, in the Sid Dale theme. Yeah, I mean, it, it contributed to the movie. And I didn't have any problems with the music. I liked it. It did what it was supposed to do. Uh, there's a scene where, you know, speaking of music, where James Darren is with another musician. And he's playing his trumpet and the, the other musician is, is doing his thing. But you get the impression that they've known each other for a long time. You know, it's a very brief scene. And I thought that was interesting because my theory on that is that, I, you know, the way that James Nerd talks is, oh, that's wild, that's a wild scene, man. Or, uh, yeah, there's a wild scene there. And the impression I got from, you know, his 
lingo as well as his relationship to the musician is that they were beatniks. Because to me, this is very much a post-beat generation kind. There's post-beat generation aspects in this movie. And I think if I watch this movie more, I, I notice them more. If I, if I were to watch it again and again kind of thing. And that's something I probably didn't pick up on, uh, on this movie when I watched it years ago. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen it, so I figured I should rewatch it. And I think that's interesting that that, that was incorporated into the movie because you have these, you know, high class, you know, characters like Klaus Kinski, Margaret Lee, you know, high society type of characters. But you have, you know, James Darren. He's uh, he's got his own problems. You know, he's the conflict with his girlfriend, but he's conflicted between between her and Wanda because he finds her attractive, but he also his, he doesn't want his girlfriend to find out. So there's that kind of, I guess, love love triangle, if you will, that I thought was interesting, and it, it kept me wanting to know like what's, what was going to happen to him in that re, in terms of his relationship. And <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that I thought was interesting. Like I said, in in you now something that. That was well played out for the time, I thought, yeah. Uh, what else? I know I want to say about this. Um, hmm. Well, there was a wildness to this movie. I wanted to say that as well. But there's a balance to the wildness because it is very much an exploitation from not really sex exploitation because there's not very many sex scenes. But it's a balance between exploitation and art house and that's why that balance it works you know for what Franco was trying to do it's experimental in a way and I, I like that because you know Franco was known for breaking boundaries and always trying to do something different and I think that's all I wanted to say about this movie uh, I was gonna check out the special features today uh, give those a whirl and uh, check this out. Even if you're new to Frank, just Franco like I am, it's worth a watch. You know, I give it a seven out of ten. Thanks for watching. Bye.